All right. Um, good afternoon, everyone. This is Yiva Hussain, Director of Polaron Language Services. I have uh, the greatest pleasure of um, facilitating this webinar, and today we're going to be talking about principles for culturally appropriate translations of Indigenous languages. And we have some amazing guest um, uh, presenters today. I'll introduce them in a moment. But firstly, I did want to um, uh, send a message to um, to everybody that's uh, watching, and um, by um, acknowledgement of country, and it's a general one which I have. Um, borrowed from uh, indigenous.gov.au because we are meeting on several lands, um, including um, Livinia from Brisbane, Lawson from Adelaide, uh, we are from Melbourne, and uh, Michael's in Canberra. So it goes like this. In the spirit of reconciliation, Tolerant Language Services acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connection to land, sea, and community. We pay our respect to their elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. Um, so thank you for, uh, for that. And um, now on with the webinar. Um, I will um, encourage everybody to put your questions through uh, the Q&A box. Um, and if you have questions that come up later on, you can always email us, you can contact Andrea. Everything's recorded. Um, the webinar will be available through the YouTube channel, but it's going live on Facebook and a few other places. Um, and you can uh, follow us on social media to get um, more information about um, upcoming webinars. We run them once a month. Um, so on your screens, uh, there's a shot you'll see uh, Michael, Lawson and Lavinia. So let, let us start with Michael, who's um, uh, the manager of national operations at NAPI, which is the national um, um, authority for accreditation authority for translators and interpreters. I think it's the official time, but everybody knows them as NAPI. But prior to his appointment um, at NAPI, he has worked. Uh, he spent the last 13 years essentially working with Indigenous Australians, um, and um, you can read on the screen about his credentials and his, um, you know, um, experience within this space. I have met Michael a couple of times and I can tell you um, that he's very knowledgeable and be very grateful that he was able to find time for us. Next uh, is Lawson Stapleton. Uh, with Lawson, we've worked um, on a couple of projects recently and I, I cannot remember the last time that I've learned so much uh, from someone um, and um, is so giving and so very, very generous in his knowledge and so respectful of people like me that knows essentially very little to, to be perfectly honest about indigenous languages and he's guided us through this entire uh, project with such grace and um, um, you know incredible respect um, for everybody concerned so welcome Lawson um, last but not least we have someone really amazing um, as well and that's Lavinia Heffernan um, who's speaking to us from Brisbane, but she is a, um, she's basically an interpreter and someone that's been um, in, engaged and involved in the uh, education um, um, sector. Uh, but Lavinia is a NAPTI certified Larija uh, into, uh, into English translator. And she also has a bachelor degree in general studies in education um, from QUT. Um, so, each of uh, our presenters will um, talk a little bit more about who they are and what they do shortly. But this is about us. We, um, um, this is our 20th year of operations. So November 2000 was, uh, was the month where uh, it all started happening. Um, and, you know, since then we have come a long way, let me tell you. Um, it's no longer my kitchen table. We have a pretty big operation. We keep hiring people, which is, which is very exciting. Um, but we've got about um, 1,500 interpreters, translators in different languages, and this indigenous um, project that I mentioned earlier was one of the first ones we've ever done. Um, so moving on, um, thank you, Andrea. What do we do? We do um, you know, everything to do with languages, but we are um, gearing towards a little bit more nowadays um, into the space of co-design um, uh, resources, and that is because I feel, having worked as a translator interpreter for many years, that we don't do enough uh, community consultations when we develop our resources for our communities. So we've, um, for the last six months or so, we've been um, dabbling quite significantly, quite, quite heavily into um, discussing 
what resources the community want rather than translating everything for everybody that nobody reads okay but on top of that we do english and uh, sorry plain english and easy english resources uh, we do a lot more videos uh, podcasts multimedia uh, resources and also a little bit of interpreting but not a lot um, so with that, um, I'm going to um, just briefly tell you what we're going to cover today. And um, Michael will talk about considerations and approaches uh, when working with Indigenous languages. So this is uh, wearing his Nati hat, but not just his Nati, Nati hat, hopefully. Uh, Lawson will um, talk about catering for Indigenous translation projects. Uh, Lawson uh, is a general manager at ABC Multilingua, Multilingua and he as well, the organization does uh, specialize in um, indigenous languages. I think Lawson will tell us a bit more about that. Um, the highlight of today is hopefully Livinia's um, presentation. Mm -hmm. And um, she called it a day in the life of, uh, of a Luritia Pintupi translator. So very keen to hear from everybody, but over to you, Michael, first. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so can I everyone and uh, you know, humbled to be online with such uh, great people and I'm always humbled in this business because uh, I am terrible with languages myself. Uh, as far as uh, language goes, I'm far better at operating social enterprises. So I've been fortunate, I guess, prior to Nati uh, to have worked with some uh, great Indigenous businesses over my time. Uh, Arnhem Land Progress Aboriginal Corporation, for those that don't know, it's the largest Aboriginal corporation in Australia. Uh, they <coughs> fully independent, they don't rely on government funding, so they self-generate funds to contribute to the social and economic development of their people. They were formed in 1972 uh, when the Methodist Overseas Missions left Arnhem Land and left at that point, it was a group of seven stores in the Northern Territory. And over time, that organisation, um, and when I was there, has grown quite large and is now the largest um, Aboriginal corporation. There's a couple of others that are sort of about half the size that I know of that re rely on mining royalties and the like. Uh, but that's pure commercial enterprise that uh, when I left, which was a few years ago now, but a thousand Indigenous employees across uh, Northern Territory and far north Queensland, uh, 21 distinct uh, language groups, over 27 of those communities. Um, and obviously some variations in dialects or um, different languages within those, but sort of 21 overall. Uh, so the furthest uh, east and north that we went um, when I was there was in the Torres Strait, Juan, uh, sort of five kilometres off the coast of Papua New Guinea. Uh, and the furthest southwest we went was uh, large Manu in Walpuri country in the Northern Territory. So really big um, uh, breadth and scope. Um, 84% Indigenous employees. And I think uh, that really set me up, um, which it seems like a little bit of a, a different move into Nati for me from that. Uh, but what it really showed me is the, the need for social enterprises, which I consider Nati a social enterprise. We're a not-for-profit. Um, we generate our own funds. But for social enterprises to have successful businesses, to be able to continue to uh, meet their mission and needs of the people that are with us. And, you know, with ELPA, um, the jobs themselves were one of the key functions of that company. But in addition to that, I mean, we were um, doing $1.6 million a year of direct uh, financial assistance and, um, and welfare programs out of the successful operations of that business. We had a, um, every board meeting that we had, you know, for anyone that's involved in board meetings, usually you try and get them over as quick as possible <laughs> in three or four hours. Uh, but every one of our board meetings when I was with Elpa went for uh, two and a half to three days. Um, and we flew, the, the company is owned by uh, the people of five communities, Galawinku, Gapuayak, Rabanguni, Milingimbi in Northeast Arnhem Land and Minjalung in West Arnhem Land. We would fly one traditional owner and one uh, community representative who made up two board positions from each of those five communities, so 10 people plus a chair, uh, into a central location. And then the, um, the board meeting would be really about 
getting those um, Australian business outcomes that we report on things like um, depreciation and risk tolerance and financial returns, but making sure that all of that was properly understood by people that did not speak English as their first language. Uh, and there's a much better uh, translator interpreter knowledge coming up after this who can explain it a lot better. But I know that from my point of view, like being involved in that scenario was uh, explaining like strategic planning is probably one of the best examples where we had a really wonderful interpreter, Jackie Jarwood, and he'd learn uh, English and his skills by translating the Bible back and forth um, a couple of times into various languages. Uh, and we would meet sort of a week before the board meeting with him, uh, the key, uh, the chairman um, and the key executive of the company. And we would go through what we we're going to talk about and he'd make sure that he had the words that would probably um, get across what we were talking about. So all the decisions that were made in what is quite a large organisation and is still going strong today. Uh, and making sure those directors have all the information they needed in the right language. And, you know, strategic plan is the one that uh, comes to mind always as one of the best ones is uh, we had as a symbol of the strategic plan, the, the Gata, which was a spear that's in Jambapongu, that, um, that word. And it was all around the hunt. So the, the easiest way for them to describe business process was to link it to traditional words around a hunt. So we knew that the strategic plan, which the, you know, the social and economic development of the people of East Arnhem Land and West Arnhem Land, the goal was the, um, when you're using the analogy, was the hunt of a wallaby. And so the outcome was the, the capture and killing of the wallaby so you could eat. But then all the things that led into that, which is what spearhead you'd use, what, um, where the wind was blowing, what time of day you'd go, what hunting partners we'd go, what sort of wood you'd use, who you would divvy it up to um, when you actually caught the wallaby, all of those were able to be used as um, words to link to modern economic concepts that related with um, Australian business. And that was a way to properly get those concepts understood. And of the 10 members of that board, there was three that didn't speak um, much English at all. So super useful in that, <laughs> but more properly actually presenting information um, between management and board members so everyone could actually understand. And I would comment that, um, I've almost forgotten my slides already, but it's a, um, I don't think that it's, used enough. It, so for migrant languages within Australia, I don't think that interpreters are used enough anyway, but I absolutely don't believe that they're used nearly enough in Indigenous communities uh, and really critical information like when the Northern Territory intervention happened uh, or in hospital scenarios or in the court systems, there's just not enough use of interpreters and translators to get critical information across. And I think that's um, it's certainly not a cure-all for some of the um, socioeconomic disadvantage that is um, experienced by Indigenous Australians, but I think it would go some way in um, addressing some of the concerns. And I give an example of um, a, a mentor of mine, and he was a director, and I won't mention his name, but uh, I worked with a, a really great man who came from Minjalung, and he was a traditional owner. He was one of our board members and he broke one of the vertebrae in his back while fishing for turtle. He was lifting it out of the water and uh, cracked one of the vertebrae in his back. He was a youngish man, sort of late thirties. Uh, and he was checked into Royal Darwin Hospital and he didn't know what was going on in that place. And we kept going there and visiting him. We were trying to do what we could as a business to assist him. But he ended up just checking himself out one day because he's like, I'm over this, I've got to go. Went back home and he ended up passing away. <clears throat> Stop for a sec. Uh, he ended up passing away from a very basic complication from that injury in his home community. And the only reason that he ended up there was because he didn't know what was going on. And I hope that in my role now with Nati, that anything I can do to stop 
a similar tragedy befalling someone in the prime of their career uh, and prime of life in their community as well. Anything we can do to address that situation is going to be worthwhile. So, which probably um, leads me into a nice sort of segue into uh, where we are at now with Nati. Uh, so, um, we're seeing 90% uh, of our um, credentials at the moment are in um, interpreting, only 10% in translating. Uh, we're definitely seeing an increase in demand for translation and um, certification in that. I'd comment overall, we've got, I think the next slide is um, the actual languages. That's the one, probably very difficult for people to see. Happy to provide a list of that if anyone requires it for distribution after this webinar. Uh, so 40 languages that we've got certified practitioners in. Uh, for those that don't know, with NATI, we went from our accreditation system, which is pre-2018, uh, which was a more straightforward pre-recorded test. And we moved into our certification system now, which is a lot more complex to um, get the testing done in with we use live role plays in all the testing uh, and that adds considerably to the, the technical difficulty in getting it done. So we've got some staff, uh, COVID has really hampered our ability to get tests delivered this year, uh, but we've got staff in the Northern Territory at the moment. Uh, they did three languages in testing last week uh, and we've got um, another three planned for this week. So we're we're hopeful that in um, by the end of this year, we'll have tested sort of 10 or 11 languages in the new certification system, and we're hoping to add a couple more each year. Uh, as this slide says, you know, we are the National Standards and Certifying Authority. We're, we're not the experts um, in every specific language. We work with large numbers of practitioners, stakeholders, uh, to really come up with what we hope is a consensus view of what's required and, and the demands of industry. Uh, we are absolute advocates for um, the need for interpreters and the profession itself. I think for uh, too many years, um, I've talked to a lot of really great interpreters, indigenous and uh, migrant languages, and they're just not valued. And I'm sure lots of people on this webinar and lots of people that are gonna present coming up you know, for so long, yeah, and I think it's hard for me to come up with a good analogy of another industry that's so undervalued for so such important work. And again, I, I gave the example before of someone I know that passed away because they didn't have access to an interpreter. We, we're dealing with really critical information that a couple of words wrong here or there can mean the difference between life and death or someone being locked up for life. And, and that's a big deal. Um, but for too long, that sort of, that mentality of they speak good enough English or, and Lavinia was giving a really, um, so when she comes on, I'm sure she'll be able to explain this far better than I could, but um, the different variants of English and how people use it in different communities and you know, just a couple of English words does not mean that what you're saying in a very legal context, English or a very medical context, high level English, it doesn't mean they're understanding and truly getting to that understanding, I think is what um, we really believe. Like, uh, you know, Nadi's slogan, the connected community without language barriers. I mean, that is a short way of saying what is absolutely essential. If we're gonna live in a multicultural society and actually celebrate, which we should, the diversity in the languages that we've got and have people being true and proper, uh, true and proper, um, uh, connection with you know, society and being socially and economically able to succeed, we really need people to have access to interpreters. And we believe that um, access to interpreters allows those languages to thrive, you know, the closing the gap targets that we released the other day, uh, the other month, um, did put an emphasis on Indigenous languages and maintaining them. But if no one's able to access mainstream Australian um, I take that word back. I don't like that word mainstream. Uh, if they're to use the dominant um, language services that are out there and there's no way to connect to them with the primary language they speak, then it's all for naught. 
because people will then just have to get by uh, in the dominant language the language to, to move on. So I think, uh, and I'm biased clearly because we're, we're Nazi, but I think without the interpreters, the whole thing sort of falls apart because we want to see people see language as a value, not as a negative. And to allow that to happen, interpreters then can make a career out of it, but also allow people to continue speaking their own language in their own communities and within their homes, uh, but still be able to be a fully functioning member of modern Australian society. So the Indigenous Interpreting Project is part of, um, part of NARDI. Uh, we get some government funding for this. And the reason we get a bit of government funding is this is not really NARDI's space a lot of the time. And it's, it's um, like if I talk about a migrant language like Arabic or Mandarin, there's dozens of universities offering at a diploma or advanced diploma master's level. There's lots of training opportunities. There's thousands of years of history of transliteration and, and, and working through what different words and concepts mean. A lot of the indigenous languages we're working with, um, you know, the 40 that's with uh, Nati now, but you know, sort of well over 100 that are still being practiced, maybe not by every age demographic, but are still being used as primary languages. Some of these languages have only been translated and interpreted since the 1920s. Like, we're talking a really short time frame. Again, people coming after me will have far better knowledge of this than I do. But we're working with really quite young. Um, and new, not young languages, young interpreting and translating of these languages with English. So lots of those concepts haven't necessarily all come across. Um, we've got no real good um, training in interpreting in these languages available. And this is something that happens with smaller migrant languages in Australia as well. Uh, you know, languages like Tigrinya or Oromo from sort of the north of Africa, they're just not getting um, the access to training that Spanish or Arabic or Mandarin have. So that already puts um, the professionalisation of interpreters for those languages at a disadvantage. Um, and what we find with the Indigenous Interpreting Project is we're, we're working very hard, much further into the training space than we would normally with the migrant languages, which have access to more training. So ethics and intercultural workshops, um, trying to give access to you know, those um, opportunities to, to build up skills and, and work towards certification. Uh, we, we are strongly of the belief that certification, uh, certified interpreters in Indigenous languages have exactly the same skills and abilities as uh, um, Migrant languages, we don't see them as different within our system at all. Uh, I have a personal hope uh, that over the next three or four years, we stop even referring to it as Indigenous or migrant. We're just saying, you know, this week we're testing in Aranda, uh, Western Aranda, Eastern Aranda, and next week we're teaching, um, testing in Arabic. I, I see them as we shouldn't categorise it just off to the side. It's convenient for purposes of something like this, but their languages, they're being used, they're part of Australian society right now, and there is a need to connect them to, to sort of dominant language um, services and to allow that social and economic development that happens from that point. So the, the other really difficult parts for us with um, compared to, again, something like Mandarin, which has over 600,000 people that speak it as a primary language in Australia, but even something um, smaller, like I think uh, Kurdish I looked at the other day has over 6,000 speakers. A lot of these languages have a few thousand speakers. Um, Joma Pongu, I think in the last census, noting that the census is far from perfect data here, but it's the best I've got. Um, in Jumapungu, North, Northeast Arnhem Land, you're talking sort of 6,000 people. Um, Anandiliakwa, sort of on Groot Island, Northern Territory as well, you're talking about 1,400 people. Kunwinku, West Arnhem Land, near Gumbalanya community, about 1,000. And they're the 
bigger ones and you know i'm clearly missing a few in there but by the time you sort of get to um the 10th 11th 12th largest languages being spoken we're talking several hundred people and the problems we've got for nati is we're using live role players so drawing the people that we need for um, acting in the live interpreter test is quite difficult uh, it's very difficult to get someone that doesn't know the other person that's involved in the test so lots of ethics and conflicts that have to be resolved but then in addition to that the examiners that are examining the language they are almost certainly going to know the candidate and they might not have been a practicing um, so in a in our migrant languages when we have an examiner they'll have had a at least 10 year period where they've acted as a professional certified interpreter themselves in addition to also having um, worked in a university style context where they've set and examined people as well to find that same level of skill in some of these um, first australian languages is quite difficult so we we do lots of um, pairing with examiners to make sure that we get the grouping of skills we might find someone that's got the right academic skills someone with the right interpreting skills we might pair them with someone that's not from their language group but is familiar with nati uh, and then try and work on it more as a panel scenario in that lots of work around the ethics and the um, conflicts of interest but considerably more difficult um, because of the size of the language not because of the language because of the size of the number of people that speak it so we have um, although we haven't got to it yet by the time Nati is doing some of those smaller migrant languages, we'll have the exact same problems when you're talking about four or 500 people within the country that speak that language. But we're completely committed to um, testing in Indigenous languages because we absolutely believe in that social and economic empowerment that comes from it, about connection to the broader Australian community uh, and actually valuing them as languages and having people, you know, I, I worked with a really great man, uh, called David Jelang out in East Arnhem Land. And he used to often joke that uh, everyone got paid to come and tell him his, to tell their story. But every time they wanted him to help out, they paid him a, a um, sandwich and a bottle of water because he was black. And wow. that is constant. You know, this is high level information that's getting passed on by government or health and whatever it happens to be. But we continually expect a local community member to interpret because they want to benefit the community or because they should because it's the right thing but no one else is being is working for free in that scenario and the information that's getting passed on is critical to people's lives and we should really value that allow people to create um, careers out of that uh, and i think overall we'd be uh, stronger as a society by allowing that to happen and Michael, I'm certainly full of admiration for the work that Nati uh, does. And I've been observing um, you know, the massive change and I've been part of it actually, uh, being a practitioner that you've been embarking uh, over the last few years. So this just really gave us a, a really good insight into just some of the challenges uh, and some of the successes already. You know, you can read between the lines that it's a, it's a generational change, it's a cultural change. But I wanted to um, hand over to Lawson uh, from, from uh, Nati to the practical application, because I actually met Lawson on LinkedIn. Um, you know, let, let me be honest here, we, we landed our project and we were like, what do we do now? Uh, and this is with the greatest of respect to everybody, myself included. Um, and um, he was uh, so incredibly helpful and I, I have so much more to learn, but I think what we've learned through working with Lawson and um, ABC Multilingua, if that's the right way to pronounce it, is how much they care. Um, like I, I cannot explain to you um, what a privilege it is to work with someone like Michael, like Lawson, like Lavinia, who, who actually care about you know, the people at the end of um, each translation or each uh, interpreting uh, project. So Lawson, tell us um, firstly a little bit more about yourself, how you got into this work, what you do, and maybe touch on some of the things we worked, we, we, we worked with it together. All right, next time I'm going before Michael, because that's a tough act to follow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I just wanted to say um, thank you very much to Polaron, um, Eva, Andrea, uh, Lavinia, Michael. Thank you. Um, hello to everyone. If I have any Ananul Patinjaya Yankujara, big palia to you. 
Um, how I got involved uh, is very personal. Uh, about five years ago, our agency did not do Indigenous languages. Uh, and we uh, got a call one day from a psychiatric ward. And basically, there was a young child who had ended up in that psychiatric ward, uh, basically touching on what Michael said and, and what Lavinia said earlier, where his English was uh, sort of a Creole, but he, he was a young APY boy. Uh, he was out of uh, Pugaja, uh, Ernabella. And uh, he, uh, mum and dad had got on a bus and he ran into the undercarriage where the bags go and he ended up in Adelaide and he ended up in the psych ward for nine weeks before we got a call because they were unable to get an interpreter. And so my journey began and uh, I managed to find someone, um, probably not to the standard that we'd have today if I'm totally honest, but I was so desperate. Um, it ate me alive to, to help this kid. And uh, we did, and that was the inspiration. And so we've gone from helping one person to 300 individuals a month now. Uh, that's not including um, projects. Um, so uh, that's how I got into it. Um, but what I wanted to show today, if I can go back to slide one, because I owe one of my interpreters. Yes, so um, this is a piece of artwork that my yeah yeah or my big sister from Yundamu did, and she wanted me to show this today. So I just thought I'd squeeze that in there. Um, if I can go to slide two, please. Um, so today I'm going to talk about Indigenous translations and something that I like to start off with is just how um, how big it really is. Um, so this is a map that five years ago I would be familiar with. And if I go to slide three, um, this is what it becomes. Now, this is not exactly indicative of living languages, unfortunately, um, but this does tell us how different the languages are, how different the cultures are, and how multifaceted it really is, and it's quite an eye-opener. Um, so today, um, we're going to talk about a little uh, project that we did in Pitinja, uh, which is, uh, if I can go to the next slide, please. Oh, so that, that's my team, or some of my team members. So um, on, on the big picture there, uh, that was after 10 hours, but I'll get to that. I was very tired, and, and my Jamal, or my grandfather leader, um, he, he was, um, Ah, the guy's a machine. Anyway, <laughs> I'll get to that. If I can go to the next slide, please. All right. So this is what we're going to be looking at, and I'm going to sort of run through the background. So um, a, word of, a word of warning, I'm not going to lie, I'm still learning. Um, every day I'm learning, so I'm not pretending to be a know-all. I just spend a lot of time listening and we'll get to all of that. Um, so as a prelude, um, just to let you know, when we do translations, we generally do longer projects um, and they usually for the state government or federal government we do some work for NGOs and universities um, I've chosen this in particular because it's a small project and it will sort of bring in the gravity of what's involved because you would look at it and go wow that seems pretty simple uh, but it's it's not simple in ways we would think um, so this project uh, was actually for a plaque in Pitanjara and it was for a cast bronze statue designed by artists from Oak Valley or Yalata, which is sort of West Coast, South Australia. <coughs> the Juna would be the sort of closest place to go to. Um, so the statue represents a nuclear, survi uh, a nuclear survivors and was gifted by essentially um, a cohort of universities and state governments as a gift to the Japanese government. And the statue now sits in Nagasaki Peace Park in Nagasaki, Japan. Uh, my job was to facilitate the translation uh, from English into Pitanjara, and we also did Japanese, but Japanese is obviously irrelevant. Um, and I just wanted to say when I was writing this, um, although it seems a bit involved what I'm going to go through, it, it sounds more complicated than what it is. So a bit of background history further on this is that the project we worked on comes unfortunately from a dark chapter of Australian history. Um, I'm not sure if everyone knows, but between 1955 and 1963, the Australian and British government essentially agreed to perform seven atomic uh, bomb tests, if you will, uh, in Maralinga and the emu field on, which is Ananur traditional land, south of the APY or Ananur Pitanjara Yonkonjara. Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of our projects uh, do carry a bit of these sort of grievances in politics. Um, but the idea behind it was that we wanted to represent the Ananur who were forcibly removed from their lands um, and to, um, in order to allow testing, but additionally, those 1200 Ananul who were diagnosed with radiation poisoning. Um, so as you can be, can be 
begin to sort of understand um, there are sort of many areas to prioritize and understand when we're doing this, particularly for a community, yet alone an international audience. So the process, um, of course, we receive the translations in, in English. And what we do is um, I consult everything, everything with our translators and our elders um, before anything happens. So we do an in-house assessment and we base it on availability, a full consultation, terminology, uh, the translator's area of expertise, uh, the time of year we need to take into consideration because that involves cultural events. Uh, there could be sorry business or there could be current projects that are already being worked on and we sort of take ticket numbers. Um, it also comes down to hospitality and resources. So if I go through that order, um, availability. So um, community, from the translator's point of view, in my experience, um, community responsibilities can outweigh a translation project at any time. And we respect that. Um, sorry business, or in the languages I'm familiar with, Guanya or funerals, um, it sort of depends on which, which mob or nation um, we're talking about. The duration can go from maybe a few days all the way up to a month. Um, there might be family commitments and replacing family roles. If someone goes away, someone fits that role and responsibility. We respect that. Um, and that sort of shows us how different the Indigenous family tree can be towards the West. And that's something that I didn't know or realise. And I really respect and appreciate that now because I was fortunately given that lesson. Um, and then we have men's and women's businesses, which um, I'm only going to nutshell because it would be inappropriate for me to talk about too much about that. Um, but there's also sort of initiation. And as you can tell, that sort of causes a bit of a vacuum of availability, uh, not only because our translators can be elders, they can also be younger. So if they're going through a process or if they're doing the process, it, it sort of causes a bit of an exodus. Uh, the consultation. So we, when we get a project, um, it, we can't agree without it being consulted full stop there's no way around it we 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 do that it's out of mutual respect because we want everything to be transparent comfortable and determined before we say anything um, the document must be read and discussed with the translator in order to establish if the project is possible or not before making that commitment the document is then discussed on its terminology its meaning and its contribution or relevance to community which I think that's probably the most important part and the part that we usually get pulled up on by our elders or translators. Um, depending on the content, it is then investigated on how to culturally appropriate it um, just to make sure that it's all good. Um, from there, we sort of come up with a timeline, um, sort of with the best intentions for a timely return for, for the client whilst respecting the existing and cultural commitments of our translators. So we're very transparent with that, that it's not necessarily going to be a couple of days. It could be, it could be a week. Um, so we're, we're just very open about that. Um, so our, to prepare into that as well, obviously our agency and the translator um, already have a foundation agreement, which was made mutually. So when I began, I would go to community, spend time and live, breathe community, um, earn respect, earn trust. And we would negotiate how we did business and we would not make a decision uh, until, you know, everybody was happy, everything was transparent. So we have that as well. But in some cases there are variables or additional services required that makes us, or makes the need to create a more mutual quote after that discussion. Um, so then we go through the terminology. So depending on the customer, sometimes terminology can be incredibly meticulous um, or you know, like heavy scientific matter. You know, for example, this one we're talking about a nuclear radiation topic or if we're talking about hydrogen for example something like that which we have had in the past um, the translator will essentially highlight these words and come up with suggestions of words that would be best fit for the target audience and best for the customer so then with the client customer we make them aware of this and we discuss the variable or suitable language to make sure that it's mutual for everyone and it's still on point um, resources, um, this is an interesting one. So traditionally a translator would work from home um, or in an office space. Um, geographically, because of our difference being in Adelaide and we predominantly service uh, Bittendera, uh, the APY is about 1500 Ks away. Uh, so sometimes the, the translator will be in community or most often our translators will live in community where uh, the resources are not always available. 
Uh, so it creates two options. If the resource is available, depending on our chat and you know, taking that onto consideration, um, it, it might get done via video link like this and we discuss we're on the phone. Um, you know, but simple things like uh, need to ensure that computers, audio recording equipment and food and stuff like that are available. Um, the other version is that we, we will go to the lens uh, where it's more comfortable um, or we will ask the um, translator to come down and I have a lot of family who come and stay with me. Um, so it makes for a good time. Um, so with the resources as well, uh, we also have to make sure with formatting in fonts is done well because depending on the language, it's not always available in all fonts. So we need to look at that resource, whether they're downloaded and done that sort of stuff. Um, it comes down to translator support during the translation. So from very early on, I was told essentially by different nations or mobs that if you want to work with us, um, you've got to sort of join us. You've got to meet us halfway. And that's been the sort of recipe ever since, and I love it. Um, so we have a translator support system during the project. Um, so we take care of logistics and support are provided by the project manager. So we have someone who specifically will work and facilitate that. Uh, we'll have mobile support, transport um, to and from various locations, because quite often when individuals come down to work with us, they might need to do other things as well. So we support that, whether it's banking or shopping or whatever. Um, the translator, so normally you'd go, okay, we'll work one week, maybe four hours a day. Doesn't always work like that. Um, so a translator might only be available for two, three hours on one day, but the next day is 12 hours. And hence that photo before, that was a eight or nine hour session with Jamal, who's uh, 68. And I was absolutely knackered and he wanted to keep going. I had to pull up stuff. <laughs> so we we have it, it sort of fluctuates but it gets done uh, the day is usually coordinated around facilitating the translator with their needs so that could be family as well um, you know making sure food's done uh, if we need to help with some social stuff or you know going through consulting assisting with typing that sort of stuff um, depending on the relationship you can end up being a babysitter uh, which I don't mind at all that's cool um, and with that, um, we end up usually doing quite a few drafts. So for example, this one is uh, after six drafts and consultation. Um, and then it basically goes to elder approval, so particularly if it's community orientated. Um, so this um, translation or the translation general, so we'll leave the original document, obviously, because that's our gauge of what to refer to. We'll do a back translation. So on, on here, you can see the original and a back translation, and you'll notice that it's fractionally changed and it's appropriated. This is a sixth draft. Um, and basically it, it just sort of shows what's going on here. So ideally, um, this is what will happen. Uh, but it's, it's really, it's all based on the, 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 the biggest challenge is not so much that, it's more so the client. And I don't say that in a malicious way at all, um, but the map is a great example of, we'll quite often get a request of, uh, we need an Aboriginal translation. And I, I get that, I get that. I was there five years ago. Um, and so we sort of split it down the middle where we have uh, clients who are willing to listen and engage um, and will incorporate uh, the translator or the elder to consult about it because it's not my place to, to talk about that language. Uh, so I'll facilitate that. So we can do a Q&A to make sure that everything's done appropriately and everybody understands. We do, we do have a lot of customers who, or clients, who will just go, just do it in Aboriginal. And th that, 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 is, that is the hardest uh, one, especially when they're not open-minded to go, oh, okay, hey, um, as Michael sort of said, I think the interpreting and translating industry is a, is a wee bit sort of, um, uh, neglected in, 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 you know, being recognized for its professionalism and how effective it really is. And so we get that attitude and, and that's quite difficult to deal with. And uh, we overcome it in the end by either declining or, um, or they'll come to the tail in the end. But essentially I was trying to keep it as short as possible. Um, that's, that's sort of the, <laughs> the background. Um, so I hope that sort of answered a few questions, but I have nutshelled it as much as I can.
You did. Thank you so much. And I, uh, I have to say, as, as your client, essentially, um, I cannot recommend you highly enough because of the respect and the education uh, that you gave us. And, you know, it wasn't anything that was particularly easy, but we, we, we tried to be, um, you know, respectful of what you were telling us, but also of deadlines and all kinds of things. Yeah. At, at, at the end of all of that, there's our wonderful uh, Lavinia, who is the person that does the translation. So thank you for your patience. We are running a little bit behind, but we're very, very keen to learn um, about what you do. Um, and we know that um, you have a busy little practice that's getting busier and busier. And you're also a mom of uh, three kids and all kinds of challenges um, in the way. But tell us, um, do you love your work firstly? And if so, um, what does that mean in terms of uh, producing translations? So can you repeat that question? I didn't quite hear. Oh, I just wanted to know how much you love your work and oh. <laughs> whether that, that influences the quality of the translation, loving your job. First of all, I learned in Yonka Yakala or Nang Judahur Bagna, Yinanga, Kulin, and Kapaka Radio, and Uncle. I'm a Christian along on Yuranga or Mount Kanyu. So hello to you all that I understand Richard Pint to be out there, which is a dialect of Pinjara and Yankunjara as well. <laughs> um, Look, I love my job. I, I, I love interpreting and I love translating. If I, if I get the opportunity to translate, um, I like to do it well. I don't want to do shortcut work, um, as um, you guys found out <laughs> recently. Um, and, um, and going back to what Lawson and both Michael, what they were talking about, is really important for our people to know what's being translated especially in a hospital setting, especially in child protection setting, especially in the mental health setting. I've worked in so many areas where um, a doctor has said, oh, we'll cut 50% of your leg to an Aboriginal person. Ah, but la kundani means only cutting that much. This is ha half, this is 50% to an Aboriginal person. So even understanding the, the different interpretation of what half means in one language and one culture to another. So, um, I love what I do and I love educating people about the differences between the Western world and, and our world. And, um, you know, I think it's important that people understand that, you know, one meaning to one language means a different thing to another. Another one is take this medicine, take, what does take mean in English? There's so many different meanings for the word take. And um, I was listening to somebody in, interpreting into Luich Pindabi and into Pindjara and Yankundara and Aranda, and they were saying, take it physically, take the medicine. They weren't saying, you know, orally um, drink mm. the medicine or orally in, eat the medicine. So, um, so going back to what Michael and Lawson highlighted back there, the importance of understanding um, um, the English language is really important and, and, and having the right people to translate and interpret that is really essential, especially back home on country, um, where there's a lot of people speaking the languages, home languages, don't make the assumption that they understand what's been said. Classic example was yesterday, we got a phone call saying that my father-in-law was in ICU and was about to pass away and in his last few days, we, I ring the hospital to confirm the story and they said, no, he's just got a sore foot. <laughs> so, <Wow>. so, <laughs> so, 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 so the interpretation and meaning gets lost and, 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 and it's, yeah, it's... Um, and Lavinia, it, in your work, what, what is the most challenging aspect of what you do? Is, is this... Uh, the um, cross-cultural um, issues that you've spoken about or so, something else? Uh, look, recently I did, I did do a translation work on COVID-19 and, and translating, and I, I was just looking at what you put up, Lawson, I could see the battles that you would have come across trying to interpret, and I guess I had a little bit of a giggle as well because I fully understand that people don't realise how complex it is to, you know, explain something like you know um those scientific words or those uh, medical terms and, and trying to explain oh you're going to wear a mask on your face or glove on your hand and you might get a bit scared you've got to you know think outside the box and think well how can we describe something like that well then you can also borrow english words and go oh like it's 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 um you, you've got to think outside the box. It's not as easy as, oh, yeah, use a glove, you know, they'll understand what a glove is, and mm. you can't make that assumption at all. So, But that sort of bicultural um, understanding, of, of, you know, of, of the spaces that you work within, it's, it's 
probably pretty essential to your job, would you say? Uh, absolutely. You need to understand both worlds. You need to, well, maybe even more than both worlds because you've got Aboriginal English that also plays a role as well. As I will Yes, discuss you mentioned that. Can, can you tell us what that is? Like, um, yes. some, some so, people might, might not know. So Aboriginal English is um, like broken English, um, of, except we're trying to move away from the word broken English. Um, some people call it um, Creole, some people might call it, uh, 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 Michael correct me if I'm wrong, but, or even Lawson, Yumpla talk is a bit of a uh, uh, English, pidgin. that's sort of, yeah, pidgin English, um, that sort of English. And, um, and there's the assumption by non-Indigenous people. So I've worked at the education, I did work at the education department where we're trying to get this information across to all our teachers. Aboriginal students aren't speaking dumb English. They're speaking a form of Aboriginal English, like Spine English. And, um, and a classic example is porcupine. Teacher says, oh, what's this in the picture? It's a picture of an echidna. An Aboriginal kid puts his hand up and says, it's a porky. Well, the teacher says it's wrong. Well, was was the student wrong or was the student right? It's just mm -hmm. understanding the two different different languages and and catering and 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 being educated to understand that there are you know there's different languages are spoken at home and brought into the classroom and how can you better cater for that and understand yeah. that better and, and it's, it's never it's never an exact science either but i think um what, one of the things i know about you uh, living is that you do advocate um consulting with the community and also researching more about um all, all the things that we you three have spoken about because um it, you know we are still flying by the seats um, of our pants a little bit um and not that we're making it up as we go along necessarily uh, mm. but certainly um you know uh, what would you say that um um, investing more into research and consulting with the community, asking the community about how they want to communicate is the way to go? Oh, absolutely. You've got to contextualise every community like to different situations. Like one group of people up in Yungo country might have a completely different practice to the desert people or um, making that assumption that, that we're all one people. Well, we all have our own different, different practices and, and um, different little, like picking data there, we're of the same Western Desert dialect group, but they do like a one R with when they write words for R sounds, and we've got two R's for the R sound. So there's there's some practices that are different. That's just talking about the English writing bit, but then there's the cultural practice as well, completely different again. So you've got the saltwater people, you've got the desert people. So it's, yeah. Things in that living here, I think it, it touches on what Lawson said before as well, where someone goes, can you translate this into Aboriginal? I, yeah. I used to use it as the example um, <clears throat> when I was inducting people when I was with Elba. Like, French and, uh, France and Spain are right next to each other. They, mm. Their people look similar. The language sounds similar. They have similar histories. But you would never call a French person Spanish. No. But we're doing that constantly with Yunglu, Aranda, Binning, like that. Just that yeah. <laughs> yeah. Different history, different culture, different language might share mm. some similarities, but we've mm. got to get away from this. It's just one big thing. Yeah. One language. Yeah. Putting people into boxes, absolutely. And I think I should intervene here by saying that we've gone terribly over time, terribly over time, but that is because you've been such fantastic presenters and are fascinating, really, really, really good stuff. But I, um, we've got a lot of questions which we're not going to be able to get to, but Andrea, can I ask you to maybe um, just ask one or two? Um, and, and thank you so much for, for your contribution, everyone. But as you can see, there's so much to say and so much to learn and so much to educate everybody about that we... No, we've run out of time, so over to Andrea for, for a couple of questions, please. Thank you, Eva. Uh, let, me, let me just go through the questions. So first of all, how many languages do ABC Multilingual cover in their COPE of services? Are any languages considered easier to interpret, translate for than others, Lawson? Uh, I'm just thinking how quickly I can answer that. Uh, so we have now 26 languages and we're about to add another four. Um, the, are any easier than others? Uh, that's a hell of a question. I, I think Michael touched on it about how some groups are much smaller than others. So availability is quite difficult. Um, unfortunately, some communities are extremely neglected and so resource is an issue. So that's a difficulty. Um, some communities even um, are, although they might speak the same language, 
um, they might be more culturally inclined what another community might be like. Um, so there is uh, certain things that won't be spoken about or won't be done that other communities will. So it's sort of, um, how do you play that ethically? Um, so it's, yes, there are some languages that are easier, but it's, it's not necessarily indicative of one thing. Thank you. Michael, thinking about growing our communication towards Aboriginal communities, what do you think is the bare minimum we should aim at? We have the recent example of COVID-19 related resources. And which approach would you recommend to do? So whether it is linguistically, geographically, or culturally? Uh, incredibly difficult question. <laughs> um, look, I, uh, there's lots of different contexts. So what I'll say is just based on my experience, certainly I wouldn't use this as a, um, a definitive answer. And uh, when you're in North Sydney, you probably have some really good insights into this as well. Personally, I think, when you let's use COVID as the example, um, I think there was a real importance to get information out there very, very quickly, uh, which from a government or business point of view could result in some pretty poor work, in my opinion. So I, I personally believe it would have been better to get plain English information out quickly to buy time to do in language properly uh, and I think that's the for me that's the bare minimum and is is get information out quick because it needed to be out there quick uh, you know very consciously I'm not using the word simple English it's not about being simple or dumbing it down it's making it plain and getting rid of jargon mm. uh, and then that buys time to actually get you know these really great examples from Lawson awesome Lavinio about really understanding the cultural nuance of it how do you get that information across how do you not assume prior knowledge of things so to get it done properly? I think mm. anywhere that's speaking um, a language other than English as a, a primary language and using it in day-to-day -day life and noting, uh, someone might correct me on this, but um, I had just said that there's 12 languages that are, that are strong, spoken by every age demographic in, um, for Indigenous. But there's, you know, those over 100 that might be only spoken by 50 plus year olds or 60 plus year olds, they're the ones that actually need this information even more. So it's always going to be time and cost that's going to come, um, will be the, the enemy of this. Mm. But I think if we could aim at getting simple, inf uh, plain English information out quickly and then um, targeting at least bigger populations that have got many age demographics speaking a uh, language other than English as a primary, I think that would be excellent. I also have a personal belief that in a lot of these um, areas, it's spoken language rather than written. So yeah. even though it's easier, not easier to translate, but easier to photocopy a whole heap of um, pre-translated documents and just spread them around, that might not be the best way to go. Mm. And audio or audio visual resources, um, Australian Consumer Commission uh, has done a really good example of this. It's probably eight years ago, now. but they had um, information posters which had plain English on them about um, scams and and the like. Uh, it, so it had plain English. It had a translation of a couple of words, the key message in it but also a button on it, which when you pressed actually gave the audio of someone speaking in more depth about what the problem was that that poster was talking about. So you had the quick visual cues, mm. the quick um, description, but then when someone wanted more, it was spoken in language, which for a lot of the people I knew was a far better method of communication. Can I, can I just add something in there? Sorry, Michael and Andrea. Um, when COVID-19 first came out, I actually posted something on Facebook that then spread out in language. And then I got a phone call from ABC. So I ended up doing something over the ABC about in language about what COVID-19 was. But I was getting phone calls from Kinto, I was getting phone calls from Papania, I was getting phone calls from all over Central Desert asking me, even in Bindara, they was ringing me and asking me, 
what is COVID-19? What's it about? What, what do we need to do? And I was constantly on the phone explaining. I felt like a broken record. I wanted to press play on a video recording or something just so that it could play for me and explain to them what COVID-19 was. Because it got misinterpreted, it got mistranslated. But then over time, everybody started to put their little um, work in and, and Kim Yara did a really good one. And um, people like Alison Anderson put up something as well. So, um, people, yeah, the few few things came out in the end, but that very start of it, the panic, um, my phone was on fire. <laughs> Lavinia, you beat me to it, but I was going to say, um, I was going to hand um, to you for the last few words of a, you know, a quick summary, uh, but before I do, I wanted to thank uh, Lawson and Michael for a very, very, very interesting um, presentation of, of both of you. We've got so many questions, um, it's not funny. So we're not going to be uh, able to uh, um, answer them, but I'm, I'm sure that you won't mind if people reach out to you directly. But Lavinia, thank you for uh, your contribution as well. And um, can I just um, get you to say goodbye to everyone? Because uh, we've, yeah, we saw the time um, that we, we, we can't keep, keep going, unfortunately. Uh, but maybe just a few last words that you wanted to share with people about your work, um, about the meaning of your work, actually, uh, um, and how you clearly care about um, the community, you care about the language, you care about what people are told and how. Yeah, look, I, I am passionate about my people understanding and getting the correct message across, not the half message. And it's really important to utilise our Nadi accredited interpreters and people like Lawson who work with people directly um, so that this message can get across. We don't want people, just government workers, just to go into community and just expect somebody and grab any old person on the side of the road to come in and think that they understand. Because um, sometimes if they, if they haven't been properly trained or they don't fully comprehend English, um, interpretive can get misinterpreted so and I've seen it many times over so if you are going out into a community if you want to work with Aboriginal people um, do your homework before you get out there and do it. I think that's a fantastic um, summary of everything that we've covered today. Lawson thank you, Michael thank you, Olivia thank you. Thank you. Um, I, we could talk for a while maybe one day we will. Um, uh, over to you Lawson I think you wanted to say goodbye and Michael yeah. Oh, I was just saying a quick bye That's all. We've been cheeky. Thank you so much for, for your time and contribution. And like I said, um, if people want more information, feel free to reach out to, uh, to us. And ha have a great afternoon, everyone. And, and thank you once again, sincerely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you.